Welcome back, everybody. Video guys apparently had a booking today prior to knowing they were supposed to be here, so we're uh, we're going to be going with a GoPro that Santa thankfully brought my son <laughs> for Christmas, and uh, he's been making good use of it. So I thought I'd show you two uh, seven-second clips. So that was a front flip, unintentional, unplanned. And then, uh, here we go, here's another one. <laughs> and that was a tree. So I'm, I'm usually like, I feel a little bit like the, the video would be better if I was, um, Okay, there's more happening. What's going on? Quiet. Quiet. This is Novak. Spoiler alert. Novak lost. Quiet. Sometimes it takes like 10 minutes to figure out where the sound is playing. It's all hidden. Um, yeah, it might be better if I was wearing it and going behind him. Usually I'm behind him just trying to like clean up the mess afterwards, so he's having a great time. <laughs> so we have the GoPro for video today. I have no idea if it's going to work, but we'll try it. Um, day two, all right, yesterday was uh, sort of like get a feel for what's going on. Uh, I showed you some examples of applications of this science to the, the real world, in particular the climate. I'm going to be trying to sprinkle that in every almost every day, um, that sort of stuff. Today is going to be more about just trying to understand what's going on with these cobweb plots. Uh, there's a homework assignment being posted today to a week from today. Uh, this being the first week, I didn't have office hours, but I will on Wednesday from noon to 3. So between now and Wednesday at noon, you should spend some time on this homework assignment and then uh, show up in those three hours with questions if you have them. You can also tweet questions or um, between now and then if, if, if they come up. Um, what else to say? Okay, so yeah, so we're working on understanding this uh, <coughs> this logistic map to start. That's what we were working on yesterday. We had a plot of the function that was 2x times 1 minus x. And you don't need to redraw this. It's just uh, for my benefit presently. We had these two fixed points. And we started writing down definitions of what stability would mean in this context. So again, the, the picture for the class is we're gonna have a function. It might be a high dimensional function right now. It's just one dimensional. But we have a function and we're gonna pick an initial condition and see what happens when we iterate that function many times. Um, and then we'll change the initial condition, see what happens, change the function and see what happens. Lots of interesting things. So um, yeah, so the plan here, uh, so this function, the logistic map, g of x, 2x times 1 minus x. Leading term is a minus 2x squared, so it's a quadratic with tails pointing down. And we just, yesterday we were poking around with, well, on the computer, what if I plug in a point between 0 and 1, what happens? And it turns out that um, if we initialize uh, this, this function, this procedure, with any point between 0 and 1, not including, they all end up approaching a half. And at the end of class last time, we wrote down a definition of a sink, or an attracting fixed point which was to look at some point that doesn't change under the map. I plug in x equals a half, I get a half back. That's going to happen forever if I keep plugging it in. And then look nearby. If I perturb that a little bit, what happens? So there's this little neighborhood around that fixed point, and the definition we wrote down was, all right, if points, all the points in that neighborhood end up approaching that fixed point as the number of iterates goes to infinity, then that point is a sink. Um, the size of that neighborhood it, we call that epsilon, an epsilon neighborhood. In this case, it was like a half on either side, basically. Um, so it's a lot of stuff. And it was a continuous interval. And nothing else would end up approaching that either. So the entire basin of attraction of this sink, we'll call it a basin, um, was the interval from 0 to 1. So in particular, if I started with this initial value, vertical line to the function, remember that's a thing we do, horizontal line to y equals x, vertical line to the function, Horizontal line, you do this a few times, and you know, by iterate 12 or 13, the computer was convinced that that's a half. 
The computer can't store an infinite number of 0.4 and 9999 all these nines, so it just decides it's a half after 12 or 13 iterates. In our head, we know, oh, we're just like doubling the number of nines after the 0.4. It's a limit, it's approaching a half. Okay. Any questions about stuff that I've said? Yes? Um, so the, uh, the epsilon? Epsilon, yeah. Yeah, so like, the, it, but we more focus on the, the, the idea small yeah. just not really need to struggle like who's a range for. Yeah. It's just one epsilon. So the definition will say as long as there is an epsilon that's not zero, could be 10 to the minus 5. We'll have examples where there's a sink and the neighborhood around it that's attracted to it is like 10 to the minus 20 in width. Little <coughs> tiny stuff. Collection of things that go to it. And stuff outside of that neighborhood, they do something else. So we don't really need to find it out. You just need to know what it is. Yeah. The question is, what do we have to know? What do we have to figure out exactly what epsilon is? No. I'm saying anything under a half would work for this particular sink. Um, it's just its existence and epsilon that's bigger than zero, a single one that you would need to think about for, for showing something's a sink. Yeah. Depending on the size of the epsilon, does that kind of tell you? Like, does it describe the sink? Uh, the sink's like strength. It could. Is. It could. So it, it's um, if epsilon were big, you might think, oh, but there's a lot of things attracted to the sink. How quickly they approach the, the sink is something that is more like the strength that you're describing. That's another thing we'll quantify. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. So, um, for example, the, last time we also talked with respect to the strength. Here it took 12 or 13 iterates to settle down from this initial condition that we picked 0.01 we did the example, I put up an example where it took 300 iterates for some point to settle into this period six. It's repeating every six point, every six times through the function behavior. And that was not a particularly strong sync in that it took so long for it to attract things. It bounced around for a long time. We'll quantify these sorts of uh, behaviors. Cool, we didn't really talk about what's happening outside of the zero to one interval. We tend to focus mostly on zero to one. But what would happen if I started with like negative a tiny little bit right here? And I drew my vertical line to the function. Where is that going to head? I'm going down to the function, vertical line to the function, horizontal line to y equals x, down to the function, horizontal line to y equals x, down to the function. So where's that headed? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. Yeah, and the same thing is actually going to happen over to the right of one. Like, one plus a little bit. This point, if I evaluate it, sorry, you can't see this again. If I evaluate it, I go down to the function, right, vertical line to the function, cobweb thing, it's got these two steps. Evaluate the, the, the point, that's the vertical line, and then the horizontal line goes all the way over here to y equals x, down to the function, y equals x, down to the function. So stuff to the right of one, after one iter, is doing the same stuff as, you know, what happens left to zero. This is not intuitive. You're not going to just like look at a picture and see, oh, for this function, I know what's going to happen. You kind of have to play around with it and pick some initial conditions and see. So uh, we have, I have a, a good example of that sort of non-intuitive thing um, and the size of these basins that I want to show. Um, so this is a figure from your book, 1.3. Uh, all right, and this is not a quadratic function. This is a cubic function, and we can write the equation down on the board. Um, so this is the function f of x equals 1 half times 3x minus x cubed. Cubic function. Okay, so yeah, that's written down here. Uh, the leading term is a minus x cubed over 2. So somewhere in calculus you would say you would remember, all right, so minus a half is the thing. Because it's negative, that means the tails are going to go like this. Big positive x's mean big negative numbers for my function. And big negative x's, because of the cube, the, the negative 6 around it cancels with the coefficients negative, and it big positive values for negative x. So the function cubics are going to have tails that go in opposite directions, right? unlike the quadratics. OK, and uh, all right, and so things we want to talk about. Are there fixed points of this function? Those would be intersections of the function with y equals x. A couple ways to see that. One would be to plot it. OK, and you see, oh, yeah, it looks like there are three. Another is to solve for f of x equals x. So if I want to find fixed points 
algebraically, I'm going to set f of x equal to x because that means, if that's true, then this is a value x that I plug in to my function f, I get the same thing back. And that was a half was like that for the logistic math example we did. And so was zero. There were two. Here it looks like there are three intersections. Cubic intersects a line in three points. Not always, but um, cool. Okay, so let's just figure what out what, what this is. So I have x equals one half times three x minus x cubed. This is an equation that sometimes it's really hard to figure out whether a cube what the cubic roots are. In this case, because there's no constant coefficient that moves the cubic up or down, we'll be able to factor an x out and it'll look like a quadratic and it'll be easier to do. There's some tricks to to solving for these things that, that we'll, we'll learn. Um, cool, so let's just do that. So I'm gonna have zero on the left, and then I have three halves x minus x, that's a half x. And then I have a half, this is minus a half x cubed. And I can multiply both sides by two. I'm gonna get zero equals x minus x cubed. This is good, things are happening. This says that x, uh, if I pull one out, times one minus x squared equals zero. We're doing algebra, we can handle this. Tell me if I do something wrong, please. Uh, and then, so this, this has uh, a few solutions, right? There's, there's the x equals zero solution. That is a root, I plug zero in, I get zero minus zero times a half, that's zero. So that's a fixed point. And it agrees with the picture. Always good to have your algebra and your picture agree. The other possibility is, uh, so that's one of them. And then there's the one minus x squared equals zero solution. And if I think about what happens there, I'm gonna move my x squared to the other side and x could be plus or minus one. These are also fixed points, three of them. Okay, so the logistic map we had I have one fixed point that was a sink, attracted things between zero and one. We had a source, I haven't defined that, but we'll do that in a second. A source at zero, zero is a fixed point. One landed on zero, but everything else went to minus infinity. That's it, like for two x times one minus x, that was everything. There's a base in between zero and one that goes to a sink at a half. There's a source at zero. One maps onto zero, nothing maps to one, so we're, there's no other stuff to think about. And everything outside of that interval goes to minus infinity. That was the whole behavior. All right, so now we're going to try and do that same type of analysis. Like, let's just say what happens to all the points for this function of this cubic. And that will require some understanding of, you know, this neighborhood story. And um, so here we had a half was a sink and zero was a source. Maybe we'll write down the definition of a, of a source. Um, is there a source in the picture? Can you look at the picture and say, oh, that, that one of those three looks like it's going to push points away. Zero looks like it's gonna push points away, yeah. So if I start near zero, let's say like right here, it kind of looks a lot like the two x one minus x picture. If I think about what would happen at this point, you know, it goes up to the function, over y equals x, up to the function, and it works its way over. Now, this is one, and this, I, that's, uh, that's, that's one and one. So that fixed point is at one, it's not at a half like the other one was, but it's sort of, geometrically, it looks very similar to the situation we just had. Uh, with the logistic map. Zero is a source. So the thing we're going to want to do for a source to define it like we did for a sink. Remember, a sink's definition. Six point P, neighborhood around it, epsilon. Everything in that neighborhood goes to, to P. doesn't matter how big the epsilon is. It just has to be some neighborhood. It could be really tiny. It wasn't for the logistic map. It was big. Um, source. We're going to want to put a neighborhood around a point P that is repelling points. And we're going to want to say, all right, I've got my fixed point P. I've got my neighborhood around it. P can't leave that neighborhood because it's fixed. It's stuck there. Zero is not going anywhere. So if I put a little neighborhood around zero, what I'm going to want is that everything but zero leaves. Zero stays there. It has to. Stuff near it in this neighborhood leaves the neighborhood. Okay? So I'm just going to write that down, uh, the definition of a source of which uh, zero is gonna be a source. This is gonna be a source. These are both gonna be sinks. So the defini definition of a source, uh, we're gonna write some math down. If there exists backwards 
E, capital E, if there exists an epsilon greater than zero, uh, such that all of the x points that are nearby, that is, in math speak, we say points are nearby if they're in an epsilon neighborhood of P. Yep. Could you? I can. Yep. Right, I'll do this. Don't break everything. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Um, all right. There's an epsilon. If there's an epsilon bigger than zero, such that all of the x in this neighborhood uh, are, they're going to all leave. Um, then, so if x is in the neighborhood of p, um, except p, p can't go anywhere. If all of the x's in this neighborhood except p eventually map outside of that very neighborhood. So again, I have a P, a point P here. I've got P plus epsilon, or P on the left is P minus epsilon, and P plus epsilon. P's not going anywhere, but the stuff nearby, nearby means in this neighborhood, that stuff goes away. It doesn't get closer to P, it doesn't stick around, bouncing around forever, and never getting to P or never leaving. It, they all leave that neighborhood. That is going to be the definition of a source. And again, it doesn't matter how big epsilon is. This could be really, really tiny. And in some cases, it will be. Um, really interesting things are going to happen with these sources and sinks and the points that go to them. Um, but this is the concept. So if we think about zero in this example, if I put a little neighborhood around zero and I wonder what happens to those points, they all take off. Like the ones to the right, they're going to one. And if I started nearby on the left, well, vertical line to the function, horizontal line to y plus x. Vertical line to the function, horizontal line to y plus x. They're all going to minus 1. So 0 is a source. Questions about this definition? Yeah? Can a source be bigger than a single point? Can it be a neighborhood where those, like it's a neighborhood where that doesn't happen, and everything in the neighborhood has takes to off. Go, yeah. yeah, so... So that neighborhood you're describing is a set of points that there's no, maybe there's no fixed point in there. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? Because if there was, it can't leave. Yeah. But if you could have a set of points that none of them stay there or maybe never come back. They all go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, all kinds of crazy things are going to happen. There are going to be a set of points like this that eventually visit every single spot on the interval before coming back. Or, you know, all kinds of weird things. But... Um, in this, in this example, you know, this is a fairly straightforward thing. We have a set of points in this area that are going to go to minus 1. Like if I think about this point right here, evaluate it to the function, horizontal line to y equals x. Horizontal down to e. So points in this area here, between 0 and whatever that intercept is, minus root 3, are going to go to this sink at, one, at minus 1, and points in here are going to go to 1. Stuff outside we've got to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so if a sinks base in a retraction is close enough to a source's base in a repulsion, how do you find how do you find the boundary between? Awesome, great question. So the boundaries between basins of attractions of sinks tend to be sources or points that map to sources and land on them. So this point right here, for example, like uh, my, minus root three, that lands when I map it. When I do the horizontal line to y equals x, it lands right on a source which is kind of the only way to get to one, because if you, you know, land a little away from the source you're leaving. Um, but yeah, so sources tend to be the boundary between basins of sinks. That is an example here, we will see, and, and in other ways too. Other questions? Cool, so we can kind of tell from the picture then what's going on, uh, you know, in between the roots, the minus root three and plus root three where this function crosses the x-axis. But what about outside of it? So for example, I might ask the question, you know, what is the, I'm gonna use this phrase again, basin of attraction, which we haven't exactly defined yet, but um, we will. What is the basin of attraction of the x equals one sink? The concept being, we want to know which points, not just are in the neighborhood of that sink that make it a sink, but 
But which points map into that face, into that interval, into that neighborhood. So a sink has a neighborhood around it that all go to it. But maybe there are points far away that eventually make their way into that neighborhood, in which case those points also go to the sink. Yeah? Can, you, can anyone see a point on the board that goes to the sink x equals 1 that isn't in that interval between 0 and root 3? Yeah? Um, any point to the left of the cubic um, like it's all the way on the left. Like, like like this point here? Yeah. So let's talk about this point here. So this is like minus root three plus some, or minus some stuff, so it's, it's a little further to the left, which means it maps. If I vertical line to the function, I go up to my cubic, and now I horizontal line over to y equals x, and that puts me here, which is inside this interval that I've decided sends me to one. Okay, so once I get in here, cool. So there's gonna be some points right right to the left of minus root 3. But what happens if I go too far? Like, what if I go over here? What happens? I get too high, and what happens if I get too high? Where's it going? So then I go all the way across. Maybe I'm, I actually probably should do this on the, let me do this on this, I'm not tall enough. <clears throat> so we just decided that this point, just to the left of the root, that point ought to be in the basin of x equals 1 because it mapped after one iterate to, to this region right over here. We call this interval I, uh, let's give these things names. So uh, I1, I1, interval one is the stuff between zero and root three. And that interval is, all those points go very simply to x equals one. So these go, um, to x equals 1. That's the stuff right here. And I'm asking, all right, well, which points map into that? Because if map points map into that, they're also in the basin. And so there's a second interval, I2, which, um, let's see, so maybe I, did I write it down what it is? I did, cool. And we can figure out what this is exactly using um, algebra, but just for now I'm going to say it's minus 0.21 for some stuff uh, to minus root 3. This stuff, this goes to I1. I2, this interval, maps to I1. Well, let's see what's going on there. So I'm thinking about a point that's now, let me see, it's a little less than that minus 2. Okay. Like one point, maybe there's some point that maps to 1.8 here. So let me backtrack that. We can think about doing this backwards. Backtrack that, that 1.8. So on the picture, what I've just done is I've tried to draw a point that's just a little to the left of this minus 2.14. And what it's going to do, this point, it evaluates, you know, too high in quotes. It hits the cubic. It goes over to y equals x. And when it gets over to y equals x, it's at a value past root 3. And then when I go down to my function, uh, I'm at 1.8 up there. That's what that thing evaluates to. And when I go down to my function, I land now at a negative value, which sends me not to the x equals 1 sink eventually, but what, where is it going to go? x equals negative 1. So this point is actually in the basin of the x equals negative 1 sink. It's in, the, it's in the basin of attraction at this interval. Not this one. Cool. And their boundary is whatever, you know, this, this point is the one that maps to a positive root 3. So th that's how we would figure out what this number is. That thing maps to positive root 3. Stuff a little bit to its left maps to something bigger than positive root 3 and therefore ends up on the left. Stuff to its right maps to stuff smaller than positive root 3, which puts me in this interval. Am I done figuring out what the basin is of this x equals 1 sink? Why am I not done? I see some shaking of heads. Is it just these two? Like these two, we just decided I2 maps into I1 and I1, all those points are in the basin of the sink. 
the leading set of subscripts here. Yeah. Because uh, we'll have the, the same problem again. If you go more to the left, and you go over and over again, you'll eventually hit like a two path at negative one. Okay. So, like right now, I've hit this spot, which sends me over to here. But you're saying if I land like here, I'll come down and over, and I'll shoot past this thing. And when I get over to y equals x, I'll map up into i2. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Something like that. So yeah, so I2, you can think about doing these forwards, which is like the game is to iterate things forward. You can also do this backwards. And that's one of the ways to try and figure out these, these sort of tricky um, problems. Um, this interval I2, it comes from somewhere. It's a little band of points right here. So if I think, where does it come from? Well, if I bring that band down onto y equals x, over to my function, and then up, well, it's coming from some I3 over here. It's to the right of this, you know, this point that I was just worried about. And that's just, that's just the third one. But there's going to be, again, another stripe even further to the left. And they're alternating. They're getting smaller. They're alternating between bands of points that are going to the other same. So, um, so I3. And I wonder if I have numbers. I don't, but um, this is uh, right of x equals 2.14 and so on. There's a symmetry here. Um, and maps to i2. And then there's going to be an i4 that maps to i3 and so on. They're consecutive, you know, they're, they're, every other one is going, there's, there's another set of these that um, they're shuffled with that go to the other sink. <coughs> Their boundaries, by the way, eventually map to these intercepts, plus or minus root three, which then map to the source. So think about boundaries, but there was a question earlier about the what separates the basins? And I said, oh, sources do. Well, there's only one source here. And now I've got like tons of these intervals, open intervals, that are in the basins of attraction of these two sinks. What are those boundaries between all those? Well, those are points that map eventually to the source of zero. This should feel a little kind of nuts, but this is happening. And they're all bounded, by the way. There's a square. There's a square in the picture, and that is a real thing. So. Um, that is a real orbit then. So, uh, these IN, these intervals, IN get smaller um, as N increases. Seems like a simple question. Which points go to the x equals 1 sink? Yeah. It's not. There's a whole, there's an infinite set of intervals shrinking in size alternating with another infinite set of intervals that shrink in size symmetrically that go to the other sink. Um, they're all open. Uh, they're, uh, let's see. So all lie between uh, plus and minus root 5. So this square on the board, this is, um, so if I think about this axis, this is root 5. And this is minus root 5. What's going on with root 5? What's weird about that? Well, let's see what happens. If I plug f, if I say, what is f of root 5? Let's see. So this is 1 half, 3 copies of root 5, minus root 5 cubed. All right, what is that? Uh, let's do it. 1 half, 3 root 5 minus, what's root 5 cubed? 5 root 5. This is 3 root 5 minus 5 root 5. So that gives me negative 2 root 5s. I got a half out front. This is negative root 5. If I plug negative root 5 in, same thing will happen with a negative. And it'll wash out to be positive root 5. So this is root 5 goes to negative root 5 goes back to root 5, goes to negative root 5, 
and so on. This is called a period two orbit. It repeats every two times, not every once. The fixed points repeat every once. In the new language, it will be fixed points will be called period one orbits. They repeat every time you put them through. Period two orbits repeat every two times you send them through the function. And that square, so that square is what they'll look like on a cobweb plot, a period two orbit, right? Because if I take root five and plug it into the function, I go whoosh. I'm imagining, <laughs> imagining this thing, aspect ratio is a little messed up. Imagine it goes over here. So root five evaluates to the function over to y equals x. Send that thing, that negative root five, up to the function. It evaluates to positive root five over to y equals x and down. So there's a square in this cobweb plot. Anytime you see a square in a cobweb plot, it means period two. Um, just like a, the fixed point means the cobweb plot. You don't even really see the, the um, fixed points. We wouldn't actually write it this way because this is kind of annoying. We'd just say, all right, period two orbit root five minus root five. Like that. We close it off with the second bracket because it's just going to keep doing that. And so we don't want to keep having to write it over and over again. <clears throat> Questions? <coughs> Do you think this root five, negative root five orbit attracts things near it or repels things near it? Why do you think repels? You're right. Why? Okay, that's true. Because root, well, root five goes to negative root five. So you're right. It's not a. It's not fixed. Yeah. Nothing would map to either except the other. So nothing would map to root five except negative root five, and nothing would map to negative root five except root five. That's true. So. Um, the way the curve of the function works, nothing can map directly to either of those, like things map to zero. Stability-wise, we're wondering, if I perturb it a little bit, will it come back? And it will be possible for period two orbits to be attracting. That is, I perturb one of these things by a little bit, and then I watch it go, and it goes, you know, a, it's a little bit far from root, root five, and then it's a little bit closer to minus root five, and then it's a little closer to root five. And, and so things can approach that. Um, that behavior. They don't in this case. This is a source. What happens just inside? Like if I threw a dart at root 5 and I missed to the left just a little bit, it's going back in, right? It's going back into one of the sinks. Do you know which one? If I miss root 5 by just a little bit to the left, I see some shrugs. What I've just said is that there are an infinite number of intervals shrinking in size, limiting on root 5, each of which goes alternatingly to either sink. So can you tell me if I throw a dart near root 5 and miss to the left by a little bit, which one it's going to go to? No, you can't. So if you tried to measure it with a device, you'd get an uncertainty, and that uncertainty would be bigger than this resolution we have of which one it's going to go to. So we don't know. But it does mean that this period two orbit, root five minus root five, this is going to be a source. It's going to be called a period two source. It's going to send things away. If it were a sink, it would attract things near it. And those things would not be in the basin of either of these two fixed points. I'm using a lot of words that you're not used to. But, uh, but we're getting exposure to them. Questions? Cool, okay. Um, so we're gonna pause on this example for a while and write some stuff down. <clears throat> Got my source definition, cool. So this is just like, this one little cubic function. Um, we're gonna be able to just using this logistic map example get all kinds of very interesting behavior and it's a very rich discipline because you end up with you know so many interesting things that can happen for very very simple functions like these quadratics and cubics. Um, okay, so a couple things to write down. 
So we'll, we'll talk about the stability again here. There's a theorem related to this, you know, are things sources or sinks that, that we'll want to write down. So let F be a smooth map, which means I could take derivatives and they don't have kinks or holes in them. Uh, a smooth map on R, the real number line, you know, x going from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, so smooth, we'll just write down what it means. Derivatives of all orders exist and are continuous. There will be times in this class where we have functions we analyze um, like this, but that have kinks. And interesting things will happen there too. But we'll, we'll start now for this. Um, and we'll assume P is a fixed point of F. So on the board, we have three of those. OK. So we want to be able to know our things are sources or sinks based on just looking at the picture without having to iterate a bunch of points and seeing where they go, because that takes a lot of effort. So um, here we go. If the magnitude of the slope of f prime at p is smaller than 1, then p is a sink. f prime, derivative of the function, slope of the function f. Here's an example function. f of x equals 1 half x. What is the, is there, is there a fixed point for that function? Zero. zero. There's only one. It's a line. So if I plug in 0 into a half x, I get 0 back, and it stays there forever. If I look nearby, and I say, all right, well, which points end up going there? All right, like this point here, does this go to 0? Well, I evaluate it. I go over to y equals x. I evaluate it over to y equals x. Everything, in fact, will go there. If it's linear, this, this slope 1 half is the, the, the same the whole way. In particular, at the point, at the fixed point p of, of um, 0, p equals 0, this function, its slope is a half. That's smaller than 1 in magnitude, and that geometrically, with this cobweb thing, what we're doing is going to mean things approach it from either side. Uh, how about the function 2x? Slope at the origin is? Two, okay, and geometrically, what that's going to mean is if I start nearby, my value isn't being cut in half each time, which you can imagine will take you to zero. It's being doubled each time, which ought to take you away from zero if you don't start there. So zero is going to be a source for two x. It's a sink for a half x. All right, this theorem says, all right, we're going to have these functions. We we look at them. We have. The slope at the fixed point is going to be the thing that I look at. Um, if f prime at p is less than 1, I'm going to have a sink. Uh, and if f prime at p, this could look like an f1. Just make sure you tilt it a little bit. Uh, f prime at p is bigger than 1, and p is a source. There's some ambiguity presently about what happens when the slope is 1. And we're going to kind of leave it ambiguous for the moment. But um, Cool. So in the picture, we have examples of both of these in the cubic. right? We have a slope of 0 <coughs> here and a slope of 0 there. And we have a slope of, I don't know, it looks bigger than 1 to me here. And we know things go away from it, so it probably is. Um, the logistic map, the 2x, 1 minus x, that had a slope of 0 and a half, because that was the vertex of that quadratic. And at 0, its slope was bigger than 1 in magnitude. And it's the magnitude that matters. So 
Let me just say, um, let me do one other example here. I've got a fixed point here at that point, and I'm going to say it's the slope there is like minus 0.9. So here's p, and let's say f prime at p prime is minus 0.9. That's a sink. It doesn't. Qu you can't look at it and say, "Oh, I definitely know that's going to happen." You probably can't tell that yet, but. Um, what will happen is if I start nearby, even though the slope is negative, it's the magnitude of this thing that matters. So if I start nearby, I evaluate my function, I go over to y equals x, I evaluate my function, I go over to y equals x, evaluate over to y equals x, what's happening? It's spiraling in. So positive slopes are going to see things sort of monotonically approach. That's what happens here, things are monotonically approaching. If I have a negative slope, but it's still a sink, smaller than one in magnitude, then things are gonna, they're gonna sort of spike. This is where the cobbler thing, they're gonna sort of spiral their way, alternating on either side of it, but getting closer. Yes. The closer that is to one, the longer it will take. Correct. Yes. So the strength of the attraction is related to how close this slope is to one. If it's close to one, it could take a while to attract things. These slopes that we've seen of zero on these two and in that logistic map, they attract things fairly quickly. Yeah. Okay, any questions about this? So we're leaving the F prime equals one example for later. Okay, so that's a uh, theorem, and this is going to be helpful because now if we want to do the algebraic part, we'll say, all right, we'll write down our equation, we'll set f of x equal to x, we'll solve for the fixed points, we can just then take the derivative of f, algebraically, this is a thing we know how to do, especially for polynomials, you know, you know how to do that, and then you plug those points in and see what they give you back. Yeah. Yes, yep. So... As I've written them, they don't look like that. But yeah, if P is a sink, this is true. Yeah. These are if and only ifs. Okay, so more more words. So let's let again let F be a map on R. Real number line, minus infinity to infinity. We tend to focus on the stuff near zero to one just to make it easy. They're simple, not easy. Um, we're gonna call P, a periodic point of period K. Uh, if, when I iterate my function f, K times, starting at P, I get P back. Uh, and one other thing, and if k is the smallest such integer, that's important. Okay, so the root 5 minus root 5 thing we talked about a minute ago. Those root 5 the root 5, for example, is, is going to be called a periodic point of period 2. <coughs> because if I think about what happens when I take my function, this cubic, and I plug root 5 into it, I don't get root 5 back. I have to then send that minus root 5 that I got through the function again to get back root 5. So it's really f2, not squared, not f squared, but the second iterate of f for which root 5 is a fixed point. So you think about this, F2, which is a degree 6 polynomial that I haven't written down, it's kind of a mess. That function, which is like instead of just sending a point through 
the original one line. It's actually sending it through twice. So the second iterate of this cubic is the degree six polynomial. It crosses y equals x at points. We can figure out how many places it crosses y equals x. If the root five, plus or minus root five, we've just said, those are points that repeat every second time through, those should be crossings with y equals x for this degree six polynomial. That is, this cubic then iterated with itself, not squared, but iterated with itself. Okay, so will these three points be fixed points of this thing iterated with itself? The zero and plus or minus one? Are they gonna be points that repeat every two times through the function? They repeat every once through the function. If I then put them like zero, if I put zero through twice, is it still zero? Yeah, because it was a fixed point under the first one. So if I say, all right, send zero through this thing, do it again, it's not going anywhere. So it's, a, it's actually, that's why this extra little bit is here. And if k is the smallest such integer, because zero repeats every two times through g. It's a fixed point of g. It repeats, if I send it through g once, I get zero back. If I send it through again, I get zero back. But we don't really want to think of zero as one of these period two points, because it didn't go anywhere. It's the root five that we want to think of as one of these points, because it didn't stay put under one trip through. So that's why the extra little bit is there. So let's look at this definition again. F is a map like this cubic we call p a periodic point of period k, if this is true. And what I was just saying is that for our example, um, so this thing, uh, this cubic, f2 of root 5 is root 5. And f2 of minus root 5 is minus root 5. Yeah. Those... Those two points, root 5 and minus root 5, they're not fixed points of f because they go somewhere else. However, because I send them twice through f and they stay put, they are fixed points of not f, but this f2, which is not f squared. It is f composed with itself. Awesome. And, and they are different and distinct from minus 1, 0, and 1, which also repeat every two times through f. They are fixed points of f2. But since they were fixed points of f, we don't call them you know, period two points because it's not in the spirit. Cool. So I think if I plotted this degree six polynomial, that is this thing composed with itself, I'm trying to say degree six is it degree nine. I got an x cubed. I'm plugging that in again. It's going to be a degree nine. It's going to have uh, how many intersections with y equals x? Well, it's going to have these three, definitely. I'm thinking about trying to draw it. It has to go through those three points because it's fixed. y equals x has to cross. And it has to also go through y equals x at plus or minus root 5. Because those points are fixed points of that second iterate of f. This is kind of tricky. I'm doing a lot of waving of my hand and not plotting it. but. Um, Let's do a much simpler example. So, uh, so let's draw minus x. So here's the function. We always put our dashed line y equals x there. Here's the function minus x. f of x equals minus x. Any fixed points? Zero is a fixed point. It's got one of those slopes we said we would ignore. Uh, what about the other points? Like what does pi do? It makes a square. What are we calling that now? A period. It's a period two point. Pi goes to minus pi, which then gets sent to pi, which gets sent to minus pi. It just does that. Yeah. Okay. So are there other points that do that also? They all do. Cool. Why is that? Well, if I took my function f of x equals minus x, and I compose it with itself, plug in minus x into minus x, I get just x back. And so f2 is y equals x, and there's intersections all the way. One of them didn't move. F, the zero is still a fixed point of f. But the remainder, all those other ones, those are period two points of f, fixed points of f2. Let me write those numbers down. So um, 
So for this example, uh, x equals 0 is a fixed point, or a period 1 point. All other x, x not 0, are period 2 points of f, fixed points of f2. That's not f squared. In this occasion, f2 and f, and f squared are the same function. That is not normally the case. This is a very simple function. But, uh, that's not true. If I take minus x and squared, I get x squared. So good. All right, good. I'm glad to see that's different. So f2, we're composing minus x with itself. I get x back. If I squared it, I get x squared. Different thing. Yeah. OK. Let's go back to questions. Any questions here? Yeah. So if you take your f2 as your new f, mm -hmm. you use those f2 points as now your fixed points to do a, like the same cobweb analysis. Yeah. That really helps you. It does. Because you know what the fixed points are automatically from the one before. Yes. Yes. But so in fact, their behavior? Like do they don't. They stick around. They do the same thing. So like. This F2 that we haven't drawn at that <coughs> degree is 9 polynomial because they have an x cubed. That's so being cubed. So will be a square in F2 from negative root 5 and root 5? It will not be a square. It will be a fixed point. It won't go anywhere because that square only shows up here. Right. But if I drew the um, F2 on top, it would cross y equals <coughs> x here at minus root 5. It would cross y equals x up there at positive root 5. It might have squares that we don't see on this, that are period four orbits. Right. Of the first one. Of the first one, period two orbits of F2. Yeah. So they have to be uh, Fk of P, so K would have to be um, a multiple as it goes on, mm -hmm. instead of just any number higher, because that only happens for fixed points, because they're one. You're, you're sensing things. <coughs> there will be a third iterate also. So there's a, there's a, I can compose this function with itself three times. Mm -hmm. And if that has fixed points that we didn't see before, those are going to be orbits that repeat every three times, and that's not a square. And that would look a little bit like a Tetris piece on this. Yeah. We'll do all these things. Yes, Andy? Did we just address the case where it equals 1 with this simple example that you did? Because f2 basically brought it back to y equals x. And so does that mean that It does for that example, but we're going to have functions that are that have some curvature. Here we have a linear function, so everything's right. slope minus one. And f two slope one. Everything's slope one. That's not usually the case. So there'll be more interesting examples where we'll come back to the yeah. other questions. Okay, so I have. I'm going to go back to our uh, picture of the logistic map here, and let's make the value of that parameter out in front a little bigger. Um, so, this is a picture for the function uh, g of x equals 3.3x times 1 minus x. So it's a little, uh, that parameter out in front is not 2 anymore. And when you raise that up, what's happening is this parabola is going up. It's still anchored at the roots 0 and 1 because those are roots of this quadratic. But it's like I'm grabbing the vertex and I'm just pulling it up when I raise that parameter. Cool. What happened? Like earlier, when it was two, we had everything going to the fixed point at a half. As I pull this vertex up, that fixed point is sliding to the right. It's right here. Um, it does not appear to have slope between minus one and one anymore. It's still fixed. It's still, if I start there, I stay there. But if I start nearby, I don't go there anymore, like I did earlier. Okay, so what happens is I leave. I'm going to wander away. That's what the cobweb will do for a slope bigger than minus 1. I'm going to wander away from it. And in this case, I'm going to approach a square. This is, this is a period 2 orbit. So you can call this uh, P1 and P2. So f of, uh, f of, or g of P1 equals P2. And g of P2 equals P1. 
So I have a period two orbit P1 comma P2. So that orbit, we were wondering about stability again, is the thing we care about. I have a source here. I have another source here, which means the points in between, they have to go somewhere. They can't go to either of those places, because those places repel. Well, everything between 0 and 1 now, except for that fixed point, go to this square under forward address. And um, we can see that. We can maybe pull up some code and do that. Uh, nice. Let's do some code. All right, so th again, this is code is all on the website for the class. Um, <coughs> what am I saying? 3.3, .3. let's throw that one in there. <coughs> oh my gosh. So this is the same picture we just had on the board. However, I've done this thing where I've plotted now the second iterate of that. So I've taken 3.3x times 1 minus x, and I've plugged that into itself and plotted that function too. So you see both up on here, the all right, we got our green curve, which is y equals x. We got our um, blue curve, which is 3.3x, 1 minus x. And then I've figured out what the second iterate is. So g2 of x, all right, if g is 3.3x, 1 minus x, what I'm supposed to do is compose this with itself. G2 is g of g of x. Yeah? So that means 3.3 .3 times, and that x, I'm going to plug in the function itself. 3.3x, 1 minus x. And then I got this piece times 1 minus, and then I see an x again, which means I plug in my function. 3.3x, 1 minus x. So I'm not going to multiply all that stuff out, but if I did, I'd get an x to the fourth. x to the fourth, that's a polynomial. Its leading term, its coefficient, will be negative. If I do my math right, I barely see that. I'm bringing new markers next time. That means my tails of my degree four <coughs> polynomial are pointing down. Cool. So that's the, that is the black, big, the black curve on this picture. That's a degree four polynomial. Where does it intersect y equals x? Zero, yes, it intersects at zero. Why would it intersect at zero if we know that zero is an intersection of the original function g? So zero is a fixed point of, of this logistic map. Zero evaluates to zero. What if I send it through twice? What does zero do? It also evaluates to zero. So I'm thinking about what these pictures look like. They should agree at fixed points of the original. Same for this one. This was at a half. If I drag. If we, I'll do this in a second. I'll make this one half x, and and this this point right here will be an intersection point, both of the original and the second one. Because if it doesn't evaluate somewhere else one time through the function, it shouldn't the second time either. Yeah. So the fixed point of g two would be a period two of g one. That's right. So this 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 intersection here of g two with y equals x that isn't a place the blue curve crosses, and this one here, they should sit on a square because they just appeared, and the only thing they could possibly be is a period. They can't be fixed points of the original g, because they're not intersections with g. So they have to repeat every two. So I'm going to just uh, see what happens. So I have my original initial condition there. I'm going to see what happens. It might get really close, but then it leaves. The dynamics that we're iterating here are the blue curve. I've drawn the black curve on top. The black curve is on top, just so you can see why. But the black curve is not involved in this iterative process. It's just the blue curve that I'm iterating, the blue and green. All right, so let me do that again. Starting with an initial condition that um, bounces around for a while, it gets very close to that point, which its slope is not less. It's, it's like negative one point something. It's bigger than one in magnitude, which means I'm going to leave. For smaller values of this vertex, if I bring this thing back down, this parameter, it would attract stuff. But it doesn't. It repels, which means they have to go somewhere else. Okay, so I'm going to keep iterating. They push away slowly because the slope is close to minus 1 in magnitude. They push slowly away and approach 
what is going to be called a period two sink. Now look at the numbers over there. Like I can just hold my hand down for a while and they'll approach closer and closer to the same thing. So I got 0 0.823, 0 0.823, Oh my goodness. So I got like 10 digits of agreement here in every other. This is of the original, these are iterates of the original function G. If I was iterating G2, by the way, you wouldn't see like all the 0.47s. You'd only see the 0.8s because it would approach one of them. Um, and then if I keep, you know, holding this down, eventually, you know, all of the digits will converge. So there they are. So all 16 digits in base 10 agree. 6069, 6069. That's a fixed point of G2. It is a period two point of G. And they're both plotted on the board. So the, the black curve is there to guide your eye, but it's the blue curve that the work is being done for by the computer. Yeah. Will the fixed points in G2 always be on the borders of the square, or can they be anywhere in the area? Good, they have to be on the borders of the square just because of how this cobweb thing works. Okay. Yep. They define the corners of the square. The top, oh, yeah. of top right and bottom left corners in one of these period two orbits define the square. Yeah. You can think of the other two legs of the square as just the iterative part of the, yeah, so it's bookkeeping, but. Okay. So something happened when we raised this vertex, right? The slope at that second fixed point went from, it was zero for two x, one minus x. It got a little negative, we didn't see that, and then it became less than minus one. I have a little visual of this, let's just watch. Um, so here, the parameter, they're calling it r, but uh, we know in our, in our example, we're, we haven't really given a name yet. So the red line is what happens to one of these points as the vertex grows. So point two is going, it's approaching the fixed point at a half. And as the parameter grows, the fixed point's not at a half anymore. Still have a source here. That hasn't changed. Points near here will leave. Everything between zero and one is in the basin of that fixed point. Structurally identical situation to when the parameter was two. And now, as it's growing, the red line, this is telling me it's taking longer and longer to converge. Okay, this is showing me all the iterations. So whereas when it was a half, it took 12 iterates or something, now it's taking more like 30, and that's what this slowly diving in is. Point, negative point nine something, the slope there. It's getting closer and closer to minus one. At three, in fact, the slope is minus one exactly, and it's no longer attracting or repelling. When it's a little bigger than three, it is repelling, and that square is a period two orbit that attracts things now. And if I initialized nearby, this big point, if I started here, it would, it would wander out to approach that square. Okay, so this is, this is basically the situation we just showed on our computer. We have the square. The square is growing, and uh, eventually, so if I think about the, where's my MATLAB picture? What is the slope of the black curve at the intersections? It's close to zero. It's not big in magnitude, the slope here. Right? But as I increase this parameter, polynomials like to wiggle as their coefficients get bigger. <coughs> Those slopes at this point and this point will grow. And eventually they will cross minus one and one. And these two points will no longer be attracting fixed points of G2. The period two orbit will no longer be an attracting period two orbit of G. And the points will need to do something else. That square will still exist, but it won't attract things. Okay, so let's see what happens as it gets bigger. Whoa. What does that look like? It looks like two squares. And, and that's what happens. The, the period two orbit, it's called a bifurcation, becomes two, these two squares next to them. This is a period four orbit. An orbit that repeats every four times through. The fixed points are still there, that one and that one. These are period one orbits. Source, source. There is a square in between these two that is a period two orbit of this function that is also a source. And everything else between zero and one approaches this period four sink. And if I plotted G4, oh my gosh, degree 16 polynomial, Lots of intersections. 
with y equals x. That one, that one, they wouldn't go gone anywhere. There would still be intersections at the two spots, because if it repeats every two, it will repeat every four. And then all of a sudden, there are these new intersections, four new intersections with slopes smaller than one that represent these four points that are part of the period four orbit of the original function. This is called a period doubling cascade of bifurcations. And as it continues, uh, what you'll see is <laughs> repetitive behavior of any integer you want. Um, there are, as we go along, there are windows where we find things like that period six sink that I showed you on the first day. Um, and then eventually when we end up at a parameter value of four, um, there are there, there is a periodic source for every integer period. So pick the highest number you can think of. There is an orbit that repeats after that many iterates, and therefore that many fixed points of the function iterated that number of times with y equals x. Um, there are an infinite number of them. They're all sources when the parameter is 4. And points that aren't on those sources, of which there are uncountably many, do some crazy stuff that does not involve approaching any of those things because they're all sources. Incredible things are happening right now. Um, and I want to show you this behavior in sort of a more comprehensive view. And that will require uh, what's called a bifurcation diagram. So, so here's a picture of the long-term steady state for, for this function we're looking at. Um, so here is 3.3 is that value we looked at just a minute ago. What this picture does is it takes the value that a random initial condition approaches and plots only that value. So pick a parameter, parabola, pick a random initial condition, iterate it a million times, throw all of those away, and then start plotting points at iterate 1 million 1, 1 million 2, 1 million 3. And if it's approached a sink, you'll only see one point, the fixed point sink that has been approached. All the transient <coughs> behaviors that would look like some bouncing around here is gone. So pick a parameter value like 3.3 .3 is the one we just looked at. That's this vertical slice, so the square. The square is the attracting behavior, P1 and P2. This is P1, this is P2. So if we've iterated out all the transient stuff where we picked an initial condition, iterated it for a while, it settles down into that square, and so you don't see any of that transient stuff, which would be kind of fuzz around here. And just plot those, those points that are left. So that would be this point and this point. And if we were iterating the map, they would just bounce back and forth between the two of them. Because that's a period two orbit of this logistic map function. As we lift the vertex, what those red curves were showing is there's a bifurcation to period four. That was the two squares. Okay. The period two orbit is still there. There is still uh, a, a square in between those two, just like there's still a fixed point. That's, that fixed point is still there. It's just you don't see it in the picture. Why don't you see it in the picture? If I pick a random initial condition and iterate it, why wouldn't I see that fixed point? What, are we, what is that fixed point, the one that, that's like on the right half at this, at this parameter value? Do you remember what, what happened to it? It's still there. It's a source. So we wouldn't ever iterate and approach it. This is the limiting behavior of a random initial condition. And there's no sources that are going to show up in this picture. Only the sinks, the things that attract. So period two orbit gave way to a period four. That's the two squares. And the period two, the one square is still there, but it's a source now because the slope of that black curve, G2, at those new fixed points went past minus one. So the fixed points are always going to be there, but whether it's a source or a sink can change. The, the fixed points exist as the slopes change. Yeah. Whether they show up in this bifurcation diagram depends on their stability. If it's a source, it's a sort of like an un, unstable equilibrium. The pendulum, you know, pointing straight up. It exists 
but experimentally you wouldn't likely observe it if you were just to let physics do its job. Yeah? Other questions? So as we're raising this parameter, I call this, this is called a period doubling bifurcation. A period that is attracting went from one to two to four. Two to the any power is observable in a very small and increasingly small window. Two to the pick your biggest number you want. There is a window, it's very small, uh, of this parameter space for which the attracting behavior is a sink of that period, the one in your head. And that's shrinking and shrinking, and then all of a sudden, nonsense. So, so again, again, this is, we throw away the transient stuff, stuff to make, make this picture. picture. You're, You're going to make the picture, picture. Like this. Not, not on your phone. We're trying to look at the transient stuff. stuff. So this, this is the long term limiting behavior of this game we're playing. We just pick one and iterate it. Which is crazy. crazy. Doesn't sell that out. So there's, there's, there's values, values of this parameter for which, which you pick a random initial condition, condition and iterate it, it, it never repeats. It bounces around forever, never, never repeats. There's tons of sources that you push around by all these sources. Period 1, 2, 2 to the 73. Sources, sources that it can't, can't approach, approach and it's being pushed, pushed around by them. Stand, stand between zero and one. Bounded by the geometry of our quadratic anchors at zero and one. Can't go anywhere. Um, okay, okay. There's, there's some structure, structure here that's obvious. obvious. Like you, you see, see there's like these. these um, um, maybe I can, I can switch, switch to the computer, computer where the picture looks better. Uh, Here to here. All right, I'm going to open some things. Awesome. That's much better. So you can see uh, there are. These are not artifacts. These like interesting, more dense regions of this picture where. Orbits spend more time, even though they're not heating, than in other places. And then they think we'll eventually be able to understand it. The reason it's stuff that is down here or up there is because our quadratic, if it doesn't get pulled up above a certain spot wide, there's no way to access that part of the interval. So when it's, for example, when the you know, three point eight or something, it's, it's the, the, the vertex hasn't made it up to one, so there's no way to get if it is all the way up. At four, four, four is a special, special number where the vertex is half one. Quadratic, a half and a half is one. One line half is zero. Um, cool. I was, I was just saying, saying some things about this. There's a period of double bifurcation uh, where two of the main any periods is available to you in here. And then there's these weird windows, windows, one of which I showed, I showed you was sort of like over here, here. Um, where there, there was a period six sync with the limiting behavior. So that's what the little windows are. Um, if I increase, increase the parameter there a little bit, 36 would become 12. It would become 24, the attracting behavior would become powers of um, um, up to two, starting with 6. If you pick a region over here and start zooming in on it, you will start to see these windows. You may not see many, you may see three or four but if you zoom in on part of the bifurcation diagram, structure will appear. And if you pick a region, you think, oh, that's like all the right. And zoom in, in. these windows, windows will appear. So this, this is our first example, example of a fractal object, one, one whose um, characteristics change at all length scales. scales. Which, Which makes it very hard, hard like you were saying, a cubic example, predict what's going to happen. If you have, have these basins of attraction and you can make a measurement, you're not, not really sure on whether the place, place you are experimentally is going to do one thing, thing or another. Qualitatively, well, very different behavior in the long run from very minute changes in an initial state. Idea. Here we have a parameter that we're varying, and over, over small ranges of that parameter, very, very qualitatively different behavior happens. So many examples of this in science and the way we've been able to observe the world. Here it is. This is a single function. This is a quadratic function. Degree two polynomial. You write it down. You write it down in high school. Look, Look at this picture. This is insane. The, the behavior. Resulting from, from the behavior we're playing with that single homonym and then turning this one over another. 
This is a very, very complicated, complicated result that we're going to spend some time trying to understand. understand. Like, like I, I, I sort of went through, went through what's going on in the picture. We'll spend, spend some time talking about it again next week. week. Um, the homework has been posted. posted. You'll be investigating some of the stuff we've talked about. I'll start at 12.03. Have a great weekend.